Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here and present uh, the, type of the paper that uh, Dr. Mellon and me uh, worked on it for about um, a year and a half, collecting data and analyzing uh, what we have found. Today, I'm going to present uh, our paper, which is about the reaction of Muslim and Arab community here in Michigan and how that uh, migration policy has affected people and how those people reacted to, the, to that uh, policy. The reaction means the attitudes or the reactions within the community and with other communities like uh, Latino community here in Michigan and also with other civil liberties um, organizations. So we can see here the title is about the organizing of diaspora communities in Metro Detroit against Trump's Muslim ban. At the beginning, I would like to introduce you to the definition of what Muslim ban uh, means here. Actually, it is an executive order. Uh, it's about the travel uh, of Muslim ban signed by uh, President Trump at the very beginning of his presidency or in office in 2000. 17. Uh, mainly it targeted those countries, the majority Muslim countries in the Middle East, or some of them in Africa, about entering to the US, to this country, either to be according to the mig migration or non migration visas. However, that uh, policy has taken several forms. So, First one, as I just said, is, it was uh, issued in January 2017, um, and it banned or affected travel uh, to the US for citizens or of Muslim majority countries like Iraq, Iran, Libya, Syria, Sudan, uh, Somalia, and Yemen. After two months, that policy changed or modified to be like version two of Muslim ban. It was in March 2017. The main change was excluding Iraq from this list and including uh, uh, putting more restrictions on Syrian refugees here by banning Syrians from coming, coming here to the US as refugees. The last version, a, a month after the second one, or the current one is still uh, effective, it included other countries like uh, people uh, or nationals from Libya, Yemen, and Venezuela, uh, some changes uh, regarding Iranian nationals, people from Somalia, North Korea, and Syria, and Venezuela also. So we want, we want it to be like more inclusive to avoid uh, the problem of discrimination according to uh, religion uh, issues or religious issues. Here is a table from the website of uh, the U.S. Department of State, and uh, those are the affected countries, the non-immigration visas that uh, the nationals of these countries uh, were banned from, and what kind of immigration visas and uh, diversity visas were uh, also, uh, those nationals were excluded. So these countries you can see at the beginning, I'll talk about here, it's about, uh, except Venezuela, or nationals from uh, Venezuela. Uh, the other countries now, till now, they cannot apply for immigration visa or diversity visa. For the diversity visa, it's a lottery. It's every year, it starts in uh, October each year, and uh, people around the, the world can apply for it, except some countries, depending on the country. <clears throat> Sorry, on the uh, quota or the percent percentage of the uh, people who are in, like from people from China, India, and uh, Mexico, are excluded because I mean a lot of people are here. So uh, the decision was to give it to give other people around the world to uh, get the chance to come here. So 50,000 people every year they apply regardless they have level of education, ethnicity, regardless everything, age, etc. 
But those people, I mean, the nationals of uh, citizens of those countries are even uh, have been excluded from the chance to come here according to this uh, diversity visa. And also for the immigration visas, they are they are not allowed since since April 2017 till now to apply for migration visa, which means if someone uh, uh, wants to bring his or her family from those countries, that person cannot, I mean, to be a permanent resident or to be a U.S. citizen here. If he or she has uh, relatives, family members from those countries, they cannot come here according to under the or to get any visa for immigration, like no family reunification, etc., because of that ban. In addition to that, those visas uh, depends on what country. The visas are different, so also people from uh, those countries cannot apply uh, for those visas. So a lot of people have been affected, either to be non-immigrant or immigrant to come here to the U.S. So according to that, a lot of problems have uh, emerged related to that ban, and thousands and thousands of people could not come here. Le they have the legal uh, uh, reason to come here, but according to that ban, they have been uh, stuck in their countries, especially for people from Yemen, you know, because of the conditions that uh, the country has experienced, uh, civil war, violence, etc. They could not apply for visas before that ban, and when it came into effect, they could not even, if they decided to travel to another country and apply for visas, it's, it's worthless. So, a lot of families have been affected, like from Iran, uh, Syria, Libya, etc. The impact of that ban, so, uh, here you can see that 60 to 100,000 visas were revoked, uh, were revoked within the first week of the ban only. That number is huge. You can see here, like maybe 4% uh, decrease in uh, immigration visa issued for nation to nationals from the five Muslim majority countries. 91% decrease in immigration visa affected for Yemeni nationals and 68% decrease in migration visas for Syrian, 70% for Somali nationals, 68 for Le uh, Libyan nationals, and 81 for Iranian nationals. It's a huge impact, and here you can see that only 5.1% visa waivers were approved between December 2017 to March 2019. And here also it's uh, about uh, the decrease of uh, building on na religious uh, issues. So 91% decrease of Muslims who uh, were settled in, in the U.S. And you can see here, according to the, uh, those who are to be like refugees to come to the U.S., and you can check the difference between 2016 to 2018. Muslims, uh, but I mean, there was discrimination against people to come here building on their religions. Why uh, we did this study, Dr. Minova and me, actually we wanted to examine how the inter-diaspora coalitions and alliances of diaspora with the civil society groups. For example, uh, a response to the ban of Middle Eastern diaspora communities in the Detroit area and how the organizations and the leaders of the committee work together to resist that ban or policy and working with other communities also affected by this ban, like, as I said, Latino community and working with other civil liberties uh, organizations. 
shedding the light on the role of the aspartic groups who uh, possess um, agency as opposed to being passive targets of right wing policies. Because sometimes when there is policy against a group of migrants, sometimes people don't react to that. Maybe because they believe that they cannot make any change or they think that the government is uh, stronger than them, so it's hard to do it, or they feel it's the less confident about doing anything else. But here we will see that something happened and, uh, instead of just being passive and doing nothing. Because if you compare any uh, policy, any law that was enacted or impl uh, implemented in 2001 after 9-11 uh, attacks, no one would argue with that because was under the national security issue. But now there's nothing happened, and the uh, administration did that or uh, issued that policy. So there should be something done in this uh, issue. Because of that, we want to check if the my, uh, diaspora community here did something different than before. We also wanted uh, to apply the model of uh, what is called uh, politicized collective identity by uh, Simon and Linder Mans, which explains the three steps process of collective action, how people could come together, and we want to apply this theory to what we have found. The methodology, the main uh, so, uh, sources we depended on uh, are divided into uh, four categories. The uh, main one is the interviews. We uh, made interviews with the leader of the communities, with the organizations that represented that, those communities. And when I say like Arab Muslim community, it's different because we have two dimensions. To be Arab, it could be Muslim and Christian. And to be uh, Muslim, it could be Arab and non Arab. So two dimensions, we have to find out how people work together. Further to that. Um, also, civil rights organizations, because uh, some of them uh, were very effective in resisting that kind of uh, policy. Organization statement on the websites and social media platforms, media reports, uh, elected officials' statements. Uh, sorry, here is the number of each uh, organized, I mean, each. Uh, Group. So nine organizations represented the Muslim, our Muslim community and four organizations represented the civil liberties organizations. This is the list of the organizations surveyed from August 2017 until March 2018. So some of them like are Muslim organizations, some of them are just like Arab organizations. Sometimes it's like they distinguish themselves of being just Arabs because they want to work with Christians and uh, Muslims at the, same time, at the same time and want to like represent only the Arab community. And some of them just like to be dependent on the religion to be Muslims, but doesn't mean that if being Muslim organization doesn't mean it, it means that it didn't mean that they couldn't work together because also Christians were affected by that from the Middle East. So you can see uh, uh, this is uh, the list of the organizations that we interviewed, and this is the list of the civil rights organizations that we worked uh, with. Some of them are based uh, on, on Michigan, and some of them are like uh, just represent the national organizations at, at a nation level, but they have in each uh, state uh, organization or branch of that, that organization. How those organizations of the communities and the civil liberties organizations worked. This is these are the ways of organizing, but the, uh, what they did at that time. So some of them they uh, did like lawsuits such as the uh, ACLU, they tried to 
question that policy by uh, asking if it's really constitutionally to uh, issue such a policy. Because if it's based on religion, there's discrimination and it's against the law. One of the, pro one of the uh, examples are people who are affected. Uh, his name is, uh, I mean, Darish Case. I mean, Darish is an Iraqi translator who uh, was given the it's called SIV or Special Immigration Visa because he worked with the U.S. Army in Iraq and he was given that kind of visa to come to the U.S. And he, uh, he was, uh, and I think still a uh, Greek card holder to be a permanent resident. But when he came to the U.S. at that time, uh, I think in uh, February 2017 or so in New York, he was prevented from entering the U.S. although he had the, the green card holder to be a permanent resident. No one would argue that he could enter to the country. But because of that ban, because of the confusion of how to apply that policy, he was prevented from entering to, to, the, to the U.S. And the ACLU worked hard to, to file a lawsuit and working with the courts in New York. And then I think finally he, he had the right to enter because the court in New York did, uh, it, uh, did, it did not approve that policy and it broke it. The second way of that was information sessions. It was at the individual levels. So the organizations of the community wanted to form the individuals of their communities, like Arab and Muslim organizations. They wanted to, uh, to hold sessions or information under the slogan of Know Your Rights. So educating communities individuals uh, about how to react to the Immigration and Custom uh, uh, Enforcement, or ICE. Because some people, they were, uh, they, they are citizens or green card holders, but they were afraid from being targeted by that policy. So they did not know how to react if they got caught by people here. So a lot of sessions, e even for those uh, who have different status here in the US. They wanted uh, the organization. The community organizations wanted to uh, get people know, informed how to react to anything, even if someone is illegally here. How to react? How to how to call uh, his or her relatives? To call um, attorneys, etc. How to react in general? Approaching uh, members of Congress, less than seven, because uh, we want uh, Michigan only. State law uh, makers, uh, Myron Detroit, he stated that he guaranteed that the Muslim ban would never hurt anyone. Protest marches in Detroit, uh, Amtrak, Dearborn and Wayne State University, petitions, positions in media, and like such as the Detroit Free Press, and finally rallies uh, with other community in different cities in Michigan. General Detroit and New York airports. And with rallies, uh, it was not only by Arabs and Muslims, but also as the goal of this paper was to um, uncover how the communities would work with other communities, affecting communities like Latinos, for example. So some of the rallies were by only uh, organized only by Arab Muslims and others by those that that community and Latinos community in Detroit. Dr. Marinova and me worked on classifying uh, or analyzing those ways of, uh, of resisting that policy. And we ended up in uh, putting the category to those ways. So for example, one of the strategies was about solidifying the intra-organizing level within the community or the organizations of the community by uh, 
it's time to work together, for example. So try to work uh, as unified, uh, unified organizations as opposed to work individually. For example, let's go back to this list. Here, uh, National Network for Arab American Communities and the Michigan Muslim Community Council. They work all, those two organizations, they are not only one organization in Michigan, but they present one of the network at uh, the, the nationwide level. So, like 22 nationwide organizations, this is one of them, or this is, is one like or the organizer of the of this network of those organizations at the nation national level. So, this is the example of how it, uh, it works: Co coordinating communities, organize, uh, organizations at different levels, local, state level, national level. The second strategy about the building inter-community networks. Again, making alliances with organizations of other targeted communities, such as Latino community in Detroit. Educate or uh, encountering risk by uh, any preparation of community members that could reduce the impact of the bans. For example, uh, educating about the nature of the discrimination policies or non-human rights uh, sessions. Finally, pushing back through facing the threat in different ways uh, and uh, to make cha changes and or ensure others' support by uh, not only uh, giving uh, statements to media, uh, to the media, but also by um, encouraging other organizations, such as civil liberties organizations, anyone who, or, or even individuals, because in the rallies, New York or in Detroit, not only the Arabs nor uh, uh, Latino who were affected went to those rallies, but also other any people, anyone that came together and support uh, those uh, people in uh, resist resisting that policy. Now, I'll speak about the theoretical uh, uh, side of this paper by, apply, by trying to see how other scholars try to um, uh, define such um, organization and how, how they could work together, communities, different, in different levels. And, uh, but, I mean, we, we, we applied, we want to see if some of them could apply to what we worked on. So, for the politicization scale of Simon and uh, Grabu, those um, as, uh, criteria worked on or they uh, were applied to what we uh, studied and when we collected uh, data that we collected. The theoretical importance and why we uh, were motivated to do that, that uh, kind of uh, study. One of them is about uh, uncovering the coalitions and their threats. So because the communities were threatened by like the government, for example, at the time, how could they uh, react to make to build coalitions? to rearrange the organizations, the individuals, other organizations out of the community. So, Simon and Flandermans, uh, about the people experienced by the politicized collective identity, by, uh, they, they defined this uh, term by uh, showing how the people engage as self-conscious group, members in uh, contention for power and also the awareness that society is the more inclusive context into which this struggle is being waged. But they uh, wanted to explain that in, the, in, in kind of activity and their, uh, this threat in three stages. So one of them is about building the awareness, about sharing 
the awareness of grievance and political identity process, such as the legitimacy of the policy, inequality, and the grievance that the sudden uh, civilly imposed. For example, here, uh, like partner organization for Arab and Muslims, or uh, the affected members, Latinos, also were affected. The LGBT, LGBT, sorry, well, were also affected because they were uh, threatened by the, uh, the that policy. They came together, building awareness of we are threatened. Let's work together. This is stage one. Stage two is about where the group under uh, the threat actually identify and blame certain ent uh, entity. Because there should be someone who uh, presented a threat against them. So at the time, the Trump administration <coughs> was the entity to be, to, to be blamed. Here you can see the uh, example of that and how people uh, reacted. The last stage is about the, what's called the uh, triangulation. The intergroup power struggle seeks to envelop the larger societies such as uh, staging protests and demonstrations, signing petitions, receiving video coverage, partnering with national organizations, etc. As I said, not only working within the community but intra-community, with our communities and with the civil liberties uh, organizations. If forced to garner broad attention and support. So, summarizing the, the ways of resisting that policy can be found here. The organizations have partnered with many organizations to going to courts, uh, talking, uh, reaching out to legislator, legislators, um, also officials, demonstrations, petitions, and uh, reaching out to media. The second theoretical importance is about the diaspora as agents. Again, being active, not passive. To explain that and to, be, to check whether uh, those communities were active or not. Uh, we checked that the agentic and not for, uh, from a traditional anti-immigration perspective, recipient of right-wing populist uh, rhetoric, not being passive to the discrimination, and have those coalitions and pressure again uh, being successful, did that, lead, did that result, result in um, abolishing that policy? It did not. But at least there was change. There was resistance. resistance. People came together, worked together. The communities, the community itself, uh, rearranged itself, itself, working with other communities. When I was talking, I mean, when I had an interview with uh, Michigan United organization, it's a civil liberties organization, but it represents the Latino community. And when I trying to uh, talk with people there, they, I was told that they did not, I mean, the, the collaboration between the uh, our Muslim communities, organizations, with organizations or people from the Latino community, they did not only collaborate on this issue, but they wanted to go step further by doing something uh, at the individual level. So cultural events to invite each other. So it's not only about this, only Muslim men or that uh, policy, and that's it. They have something to do for, uh, uh, in addition to what they uh, worked on that. Again, it did not result in abolishing that policy, but it made uh, some changes. The, also, the theoretical importance of the as agents here uh, about uh, uh, author or scholar Van Zomeren. And he explained in his uh, theory, and we wanted to apply that to what we did in the, in the paper, about the perception of injustice and how people could come together. 
whether to make changes or not because being targeted is not the, the issue. Do you feel or did you feel that you were targeted? Is there any perception of injustice? Because when you feel that it's, there's something unjust, then you can do something. And people did that uh, as a reaction to uh, the, the Muslim man. But the uh, more important thing is about not only the perception, the perception of unjust, but the injustice based emotions when they come together and uh, work uh, collectively. The contribution of this paper was about showing the dynamics of how group, uh, groups mobilize in any way as agents respond to, uh, to being targeted by the official government, filling the gaps in the literature by looking at the Arab Muslim uh, organizations in a new way, exploring the alliances among the organizations, local level, uh, villages, uh, linguistic lines across ethnic uh, groups, and helps uh, explain how diaspora respond to white wing populism. Before I end, I just wanted to explain why we put the picture here of um, family from people from uh, East Asia or from Japan because in the 1943 to 1945, I think, people from Japan because World War II was, Japan was engaged against, uh, against the US. And uh, people from Japan were uh, accused to be like spies to Japan against the US. So they were forced to live in camps at that time under the discrimination uh, policy. And the uh, interesting thing that uh, the Arab American Museum here in, in Dearborn, they held session at that time when there was uh, um, um, resisting against that, against that policy. So people from like, uh, who were kids and they were at that camp, in that, in those uh, camps, they came and participate in those events. And they wanted to support uh, those communities against that policy in order not to repeat the same uh, tragedy at the time of being discriminated according to your ethnicity, origin, religion, etc. Thank you very much. Lots of time left for questions and comments. Uh, directed to uh, Ahmed and perhaps also to Professor Marinuba. Of course, go. I'm curious what you learned about the conflicts between the groups as opposed to the, the cooperation that emerged. And, and, and like, what would be the kind of nature of the conflicts and uh, things like that? Or, did everyone just come together peacefully and sing kumbaya? And yeah. <laughs> um, actually, more so in terms of mitigating conflicts, one of the interesting things we found is you had uh, people who were uh, Chaldeans, who had traditionally kind of been at odds with uh, Muslims because uh, some of them come out of uh, facing ISIS in Iraq and so on, and they had opposed building a mosque and etc. But all of a sudden, in the Trump uh, and the Trump administration, they were facing deportation of Chaldeans. So actually you had a collaboration between Chaldean community and Muslim organizations, which was actually a break with the past. Uh, so uh, we, th that's one of the effects of kind of mitigating conflict. So if anything, I don't know if everybody sang Kumbaya, but the, the effect was that it actually drew more people together than exacerbated conflict, at least for local organizations. That's what uh, we found. Uh, uh, you know, we, we didn't really study examples of, um, I don't know that even in those marches there were, there was no kind of counter march, right? I .e. there was no. Uh, if you have the, the uh, marches against the ban, you didn't have kind of a, a right wing uh, supporters, etc., coming to uh, against that. So we didn't we didn't really find conflict. It was more kind of a, a coalition building. So it was in this case, uh, 
Uh, and we, you would expect the conflict, of course, to be with organizations that are kind of more right-wing or supporters of this uh, um, more nativist uh, policy. Well, I'm actually kind of curious about the conflicts between groups that might be ideologically similar, but come from different places, like the cooperation between the Latinos and the Arabs doesn't seem like a natural partnership in most cases. And like, they've got shared interests, but like sort of a predominantly Catholic organization and probably Muslim organization. Like, like, how did that work? Like, 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 like how did they, I'm not sure how to put it, like how did they break bread? That they felt under, well, the Latinos feel under threat because there is an increasing, uh, uh, increasing number of deportations under the Trump administration, right? I mean, the deportations under Obama, but now the administration, the deportations are more intense, and there's actually a lower bar. So therefore, kind of uh, Latino group care about the rights of the undocumented, and uh, with with the Muslim ban, there was you know discrimination against Muslim American organizations. So organizations such as uh, Michigan United and others were kind of a bridge in bringing those together. But it's more the fact that all of a sudden in this administration, they felt like being the other, uh, and so we have a spread all between undocumented and communities that uh, actually uh, are documented in our citizenship, but are having kind of their citizenship reunification and citizenship rights eroded. So uh, they came together primarily through activists. That's another thing. Primarily through the, the people that have sustained it, sustainably been involved in the past in working with those organizations, and they uh, brought it uh, together. In one of the cases, you actually had a, a, a march between a Latino church and one of the uh, the Yemeni uh, Muslim organization that you interviewed. So it was primarily through kind of community leaders, but uh, and participation in joint marches and uh, joint petitions. So, uh, yeah, it's an uh, it's an unlikely coalition. That's one of the things we found interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add something uh, to what Victor <coughs> said. Um, this doesn't say that all of the organizations of this can this communities. They agree about uh, or disagree with that policy. Some of them were neutral. They did not support. They did not oppose. They just wanted to uh, say nothing about it. So, but the the majority of those organizations uh, agreed about resisting that policy. I mean, I'm talking about the Arab Muslim communities. So, it doesn't mean that 100% of the organizations they agreed about that. Some of them did not want to engage in that. But just the minority of those organizations. And if I can just say something, just to, I mean, Ryan already said it in kind of the second slide, but the reason we wanted to do this paper is because we felt that uh, one is application for visas, right? Every country has a discretion to decide to whom they extend visas and so on. So if you have a Muslim ban, it does discriminate against you know people, Muslims coming into the United States. But particularly, our concern was that uh, uh, the issuance of immigrant visas, because it interferes with family reunification. So you basically have de facto a creation of two-tier citizenship, and this is what the effect is. Before, you used to have, from those countries, about uh, 1,800 to 2,000 visas issued a month, immigrant visas, and now you have something like 250. There was an article in the Washington Post today. So basically, what it has done is, uh, is similar to the 1882 Chinese American Act, which excluded Chinese uh, from uh, getting old rights overseas, etc. You have people who are American citizens, Yemeni, Syrian, uh, uh, Iranian, Libyan, who cannot reunite with their spouses or children, and that is really interferes with citizenship. We're not really that concerned. Uh, somebody who wants to come as a student to the U.S. that's a privilege, it's not a right. But you basically are putting into law and shining discrimination of kind of two-tier citizenship. And uh, uh, Congressman uh, Lewis, when the Supreme Court upheld it, said, you know, I would never uh, believe I would see something like Korematsu uh, and Dred Scott versus uh, Dred Scott decision kind of, uh, you know, enshrined into law, but this is what it does in terms of citizenship of these uh, targeted groups. And that's, that's, that's what we find most problematic. It's not that, you know, I mean, there's the religious discrimination aspect too, but what we find most problematic is for those groups that actually erodes your citizenship and puts that into law, and that is, you know, I mean, explain to a Yemeni American how he has a wife and child overseas and his citizenship is just as worth it as somebody who's not Yemeni American. It's, it's de facto <laughs> discrimination. I saw a question somewhere over here. Yeah, uh, it wasn't a question, was, um, I was kind of saying, speaking of the band that you were talking about, when I was coming back from, well, me and my brother were coming back from Lebanon. Um, we're both citizens and we're all like, all that, but then we got stopped, and then they like took us to the side, and they had to like, and I 
and I, I don't know if I'm gonna actually say investigate, but like, I told my professor about that, but they took us to the side and like for almost 30 minutes, in, uh, 30 minutes to an hour, they were just asking us about like everything that we did and like what do we have in the bags and like all that stuff. Like, where do you guys go over? Where do you guys go you guys in the village? Where do you guys near Syria? Where do you guys near here? Like, where do you guys, all that stuff. And then we asked them like, why I guess in the end. And then they told us, they didn't like tell us a, a good explanation, but they just said, we were just uh, asking people that came back from countries like that like, to have conflict in the Middle East. But there was other people like me, my brother also, who were coming back from the same country nothing happened to them in the South Korean okay. um, Similar to what you were saying about uh, how you break bread, I was interested how uh, in, in the PowerPoint was like LGBT groups are also involved in the in the demonstrations and whatnot and I was just curious was that similar to more similar to like the Latino Americans where they uh, were joining the protests in in uh, defiance to like the, the right wing populist policies that they were kind of on the same agenda of like how you're saying with the um, the document uh, undocumented status of immigrants and whatnot and uh, or was that more spurred from uh, an LGBTQ uh, population within the Arab uh, American community and the Muslim American community in Metro Detroit. That's interesting. My uh, my impression is that it didn't come from the uh, Arab and Muslim American community in Metro Detroit. I think it came from some of activist, some uh, kind of LGBT activists, but I don't think it it didn't really originate with Arab and Muslim Americans. Okay. So it, it was a collaboration, but uh, yeah, most uh, it wasn't really. Um, I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about how the convening of the coalition happened, whether it was more, whether you found it to be more uh, driven by the leadership of the more institutionalized members of the coalition or grassroots, or how did, it, how did the initiation of the coalition come about? Yeah, most of the time, uh, the coalition uh, were built according to at the organization's level, most of the time. And uh, as uh, Victor Mareva said, with regard to the two communities, Arab Muslims and Latino community, they worked as organizations. And you know, the, I mean, people, most of the time, they look at their organizations or the organizations that uh, are present in. And because of that, they could not like, I mean, could, couldn't have uh, planned such rallies without uh, any organization, organization level corporate corporation. So I, I don't think that it was about the leaders of the communities because the leadership is in the organization. organization so I mean, in the community. the case of uh, was Hamid Darwish, who was a translator in Syria, and uh, he had visas granted for him and his family this year, or in 2017, and then they were they were barred from entering and banned from the event. So I think you might have mentioned by accident that they had green cards as well. Is there any danger of people with green cards or visas getting those, getting those documents revoked? Because they're not, you know, they're, they're not residents or citizens, but you know, they still have those documents. Is there any danger of people like that in other countries on that list not being able to enter now? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I believe that according to the story of uh, Mr. Dorish, it was not his first time to come to the U.S. I mean, he was traveling. It was in the U.S. and he uh, was uh, granted the green card according to the SIV. But he traveled out of, out of the United States for some reason, I don't know, maybe New York or somewhere. I think, I think he came from Europe uh, in a visit to uh, his relatives. But he had a green card at that time. If, it, uh, if it's possible to ban people from, or prevent people from entering the US, even if they have the green 
card B, uh, sorry, the green card. <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, it's up to to the uh, police and uh, the Air Force. But it could be, yeah, it could affect I mean, the story of a uh, uh, student here who uh, just uh, mentioned this story. Although uh, uh, he and his brother, his brother uh, are citizens, so that did not uh, put them away from being asked or investigated. So I think, yeah, the green card holders could uh, face something uh, more serious. Specifically regarding the Muslim ban, the very first situation when it came to print when it was issued, it actually did include green card holders. And you had protests national, internationally across airports, like in, uh, in New York, in, uh, in Detroit, in Boston, and many airports, like mass. And actually, within after that first weekend, it was like that part was changed where you know green card holders were not included, they were scrapped. But, you know, but, but the very first print out of it included green card, green card holders, and that's when the Darwish family got caught into it. And then the ACLU made sure they took it to court, so they have like a precedent. So currently, it doesn't uh, involve green card holders. But as Red pointed out, the whole climate is one where kind of the doors in terms of immigration are closing. So uh, uh, it doesn't threaten green card holders, but it uh, kind of prospects in terms of how where the future of immigration policy is going. It's more towards closing doors, uh, if you will. So it's not a, in, in this in the current era. So it's possible. It's possible. It, I mean, it, what would mean? It would just mean kind of a reduction. So, for example, for people from uh, Syria, uh, uh, Yemen, uh, uh, and uh, you know, Sudan was also on that list. You had something called temporary protected status, which is not a right to settle or have a green card, but it means the right to legally uh, be here if you're uh, facing conflict in the home country. And what happened in 2018? They said there was a question whether you, that those would be renewed for several years. And for uh, the existing ones, they were renewed, temporary to protect the status for a few years. But for new one, new ones were not issued. So you see this is a way where kind of you're limiting uh, uh, migration to the country. So therefore, people that already had temporary protected status from before were able to extend it. But they said, we're not going to extend temporary protected status to new people, you know, even if you have like a war going on in Syria. Did, did that apply to people like the or the No, that was for people that are fleeing war in uh, kind of well, uh, n n not really dreamers, it's a different category. It's a category generally that uh, awards kind of uh, legal protection to people that are uh, in wartime and it's not permanent settlement. It's kind of a temporary legal status. Uh, the dreamers are uh, a different um, category of children that came up and that's not So that's yeah, kind of that shows you the overall. Yeah. I have a question. Um, do you think that this travel ban will eventually extend to countries in Europe where there are big Muslim populations like Russia, um, Albania, Bosnia? Will it affect immigrants from there coming to the U.S., do you think? Um, that's what you think. I, I think that that would be speculative. Um, if you look at the statistics, for example, where refugee resettlement is, the Migration Policy Institute uh, released, and, uh, uh, if you look at uh, they looked at the areas of the world uh, from 2016, which was still a little bit before the Trump administration, to 2019, which was mostly under the Trump administration. Uh, the, the trend is that uh, there's a decline in refugees from different parts of the world. The largest decline is from Middle East and North Africa, where 91% decline of kind of refugee admissions. And the only increase is actually the 19% from Europe, and particularly a number, I think more than 4,000 uh, refugees in the Middle East from the Ukraine and so on. So uh, the, it's unlikely because in the European case, you would also be, uh, you know, you, 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 it's hard to target Muslims because, uh, you know, if you're if you're French and you're Muslim, you would have to kind of come up with a black black policy that discriminates against French. So it's speculative, but I don't think it will be uh, targeting uh, countries. And also, if you're trying to cater to kind of a, an audience that. Uh, or uh, an electorate that wants a more nativist set, uh, sentiment where a, a certain groups don't belong. This is something that where you're limiting from certain countries, but you can also go in front of an, uh, an audience uh, of uh, people that would vote for you and say, look, we did something about you know, Muslim immigration to the US. Because in the election, it was we would li limit all kinds of Muslims entering the US, right? That was the statement, and then that changed. But it's also something that you can take to voters and say, look, you know, we've limited Muslim immigration to the United States, just these, these countries. So I, 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 think, I wouldn't think that it's likely. Uh, and the other thing is it doesn't cover all Muslim countries, right? It just covers kind of a select of what it is, um, interference with the rights of limits of citizenship for people that are from those um, fighting around in Muslim countries. When 
to ask a question across there. Um, and I was curious, in your interviews with the uh, organizations, in the beginning, did they have any like um, issues or problems with organizing or educating communities on whether, um, uh, if they were at risk of anything, when this ban first went to place? Like, uh, I do know that a lot of people, like, um, like for instance, uh, I have some immigrant friends that were, when Trump got elected in the office, they uh, were apprehensive about doing anything because they didn't want to threaten their immigration status or anything like that. Was there a similar response in the Arab or Muslim community uh, where people, instead of uh, wanting to go out and uh, organize or anything to, to fight it, would rather just uh, try to remain as uh, innocuous or like inconspicuous in, in hopes of like avoiding it? Was that an issue in the local community? Um, you mean those who have who are not citizens, they they did not want to endanger their yeah. status. Yeah, well, you, you can go both ways. Like, um, you, whether they um some some family members might already have citizenship, but then they had family members that were uh, pending status or or maybe not are undocumented in some ways. Um, and then those even even if the family members were citizens, they didn't want to participate in any of the demonstrations or anything with the organizations in fear of uh, possible retribution or like investigation, not investigation, but like being uh, revealed in some way that they could affect their status. Whether that was founded in, uh, whether that would, that would actually happen or not, there might have been a fear of that. Yeah, the most uh, motivated people were uh, were the most affected by that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, any other like people within the community supported that. So those who, were, who had like uh, pending status I, I don't think that it would affect them if they participated in that. Mm -hmm. I did, did not hear anything about that. But what I, what I um, um, knew from, I mean, what I was informed about that is the most affected, the most motivated. But that, I mean, the other people that came after, oh. after that. So the people that were most at risk seem to be uh, more active, you would say? Yeah, the, um, the most important thing is about uh, know your right. <coughs> It was, I mean, because everyone, uh, I mean, not everyone, most of the people did not know how to react. They were um, uh, asked or checked by the ICE mm -hmm. in this case. Yeah. So most of the people went to those sessions to know what to do. Uh, either to be like citizen, uh, green card holder, or even to have like another immigration visa, mm -hmm. or have something like asylum seekers, they have pending mm -hmm. uh, cases. All of them, all of those people uh, were uh, motivated to attend most of those sessions. But uh, with regards to the rallies, I believe that, as I said, the most affected, the most uh, motivated. Okay. okay, well, thank you so much.